Uh, right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. And welcome to our series of interactive sessions, which we've designed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Anita Jewett, and I'm a partner at Owen Mitchell, and I'm hosting today's session. And I have pleasure in welcoming Prash Kotecha, who is founder of Stress to Success and is today's guest speaker. So good morning, Prash, and thank you for joining us. And today, Prash is going to be talking about improving structure and routine in order to improve productivity and focus. So by way of an introduction, Prash is a well-being expert, a speaker, podcast host, and social media influencer. And he has over 25 years of experience with both uh, corporate and well-being experience. And he helps leaders navigate stress and uncertainty to boost their resilience their impact and their career fulfillment. And in terms of my background, I work full time, as does my husband. We've got three young children, uh, twins who are three and a five-year-old. So I used to think things were full on a few weeks ago and how the world has changed in the space of a few weeks. Um, it's fair to say these are not normal times and extremely challenging for everyone for loads of different reasons. So Prash, Really excited to hear what you have to say today. And I can't think of a more acute time when leaders need to be able to navigate our way through stress and uncertainty, both in terms of the people we manage, but also in terms of our own stress as leaders and ensuring that we remain refreshed and focused. And I've been reading a few articles recently on leader fatigue, which really struck a chord with me. And at a time when we're managing people who are themselves feeling quite anxious, um, how do we do that in a way that we support them, but also um, as leaders in businesses that we are ensuring productivity and output. And together with all of that, we are doing it remotely for most of us for the first time, um, everyone is at home. So a whole new raft of challenges. So I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. And Prash, before I hand over to you, uh, for all of um, our attendees, just a few housekeeping points. If you have any technical issues, you can submit your question directly to technical support. It should be at the top of your screen. And we've had quite a few questions sent through already. So thank you so much for those. Um, that's great. And if you'd like to ask questions, please do that as we go along. That would be brilliant. And we may pick up a few as we go along, but we will pick up hopefully as many of those as we can at the end. And finally, we're recording this session, so we will send the recording out afterwards. So that's it from me. Prash, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. I hope you can hear and see me clearly, and it's still stable with all the things that we have, a little gremlin. Can indeed. Can hear and Excellent. see. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Firstly, thank you. Thanks to uh, Timo and Mitchell, everybody who has been involved across the spheres to make this possible. As Anita very eloquently and very kindly said, my name is Prash Katecha, and I have been, I'm Lond I was pretty much raised in London in the very early 70s. Uh, parents were immigrants from East Africa, of Indian origin, and my ascent was in the financial services sector in banking and technology, and that was my traditional career. Uh, uh, just had the real pleasure of working with a bunch of well-known financial organizations, other businesses as well, over the past sort of 25, 27 years. I think I shaved it down. I didn't want to sound too old, but hey, that's okay. Age is just a number, right? So 25 to 27 years working in those organizations. And during that time, my childhood, which and uh, growing up was a particularly difficult time. There was hardship. Uh, emotional, physical abuse, bullying, I was in a gang, or a lot of difficult times losing my parents. And all of those traumas really sent me on a journey of self-discovery. And that journey of self-discovery led me to pursue answers to life's questions, pressing questions. It also toughened me up in the process. And as I started to learn more about self-growth, personal development, some of the classic authors, Tony Robbins, others, anybody who I could get my hand on looking at the world religions, I was looking to find answers to help to embellish how I could be in the world and how I could show up. 
And through that trauma, I was able to discover routines, techniques, and processes that were actually helpful to myself, the people around me. And that started to become a parallel discipline alongside my corporate career. And so around 10, 12 years ago, it started to become more of a regular feature where I started to set up a coaching and consulting practice, uh, working with individuals and organizations. And that's just really blossomed side by side along with what I've been doing. And so my corporate kind of traditional corporate career has kind of tapered off and being replaced now with this full-time profession. And I have the distinct privilege to work with both individuals and teams and organizations in this well-being space to bring about positive changes and especially focused in this area of resilience, reducing stress, increasing productivity, and really also helping people to find a sense of fulfillment and purpose in what they're doing. And the other way I do that is through a podcast. I'll mention that later, but um, as you'll discover here, I do like the sound of my own voice, so I'm going to talk a fair amount. So it was only natural, and certainly, uh, you know, members of the family were tired of hearing me, so I figured I'll set up a podcast and unleash my voice on other people. So fast forward a couple of years, we have a podcast, we invite industry specialists and and also, I have a presence on social media where we do motivational talks and stuff like that. So that was a little bit of background of where I come from, Manita. Thank you. Great. If we uh, move on to the next slide, I will share an overview of what we're going to cover. So as Anita rightly alluded to, we're going to look at three key areas. Now, I just want to preempt this whole session by saying I know there are a lot of well experienced individuals on this call. You've all been through difficult times yourself. You'll all have read productivity manuals and attended soft skills training. So I'm not going to attempt to teach you to such black eggs. What I am going to try to do is take some of the disparate and uh, spread out wisdom that is out there and consolidate it into things that I've seen working with both my clients, or my personal space, and other areas. And so that's the kind of focus I've looked to bring together. So if some of it looks like it's repeated, bear with me. We've tried to consolidate, consolidate it in a way that will hopefully offer some value. So three areas we're going to look at. We're going to look at improving our routine and structure for a better work-life balance. Now, that will naturally need to improve productivity and time efficiency. We'll also look at improving our productivity with handling our family, our kids, and just our household, how we can still maintain some sense of productivity. Again, that will help to become, help us to become more resilient. And then also we'll look at practical hacks to reduce stress and restore focus. And then my hope in doing this is that not only can we reduce our stress, increase our resilience, but we'll also be better engaged with our colleagues, with our leadership teams, and so forth. And so I'm hoping that the content of this presentation will be applicable to both leaders who have tuned in here and colleagues as well and teams as well. So there's a real synergistic point where we can all benefit from the self-care and the self-improvement techniques that we'll share here. So with that being said, Anita, if you're okay, I will move on to the first section. Okay, so building better structure. So with building better structure, and nothing on this should look too unfamiliar to all of you who've been bombarded by amazing free articles on LinkedIn and every other platform that you can imagine with great tips. Uh, but let's look at them in a bit of a sequential and structured way. We've got five elements that I see should make up our week. We've got our main job, our main work, our, or those of you who are business owners, your business. That's the first pocket that will feature typically daily. The second element that will feature is self-care. Mental and emotional and, of course, physical fitness falls under that category. And when we're talking about mental and emotional health, all the sorts of activities and self-care routines that we could or should be doing and we hear about. Then the third pocket is people. Of course, that's our household, family time. Staying connected with others as well, so those family members and friends who obviously we're having to virtually connect with. And, of course, dependent care as well with those members in our household or elders that we are responsible for. The fourth area is domestic duties. No stranger there, uh, cooking, cleaning, obviously shopping, finances. Uh, I can't tell you the amount of cooking skill repertoire that I've uh, accumulated in the past few weeks. It's, it's unbelievable. 
you have to become versatile in this area. So domestic duties are not to be uh, shunned away by anyone. Uh, unavoidable. Anita, you know this. Um, and, <laughs> and positive distractions. I call them positive distractions. Um, I put a spin on it because a lot of us feel that hobbies are something that take a backseat role to our career and to what we've got to achieve and to our family. But actually, hobbies are a powerful way to reinvigorate our cognitive abilities to help us to focus and actually do better in our work. So I'm going to call them positive distractions, and we'll look at some of these a little bit later on. But this is old as well as new hobbies, especially during this lockdown climate, where we can do virtual online learning, where we can learn a new skill or a hobby, or co-learn with a family member, so they, thereby we can engage our children as well. And of course, the all-important downtime, all that productive unproductivity, in my language, because there has to be time where you're just zoning out, binge watching on Netflix or whatever is your poison, just to let that brain have a little bit of a rest. So those are the five key pockets that should make up the week. Now, at the bottom here, I've indicated there are two success factors to make this happen. One is to look at how to divide them into daily and weekly pockets. That is to say, while some of these will feature daily, and inevitably, others may not feature every single day. So you may not be able to do certain things, certain domestic duties, certain positive distractions may not occur every single day. But the intention is to invite everyone here to look at how you can take these five key areas and, and structure them throughout the week. And one way to look at structuring them is to time shift these elements. So typically, you know, if you have a Gantt chart, you may have your day look mapped out and you have colored you have different colors to map out these different areas. And you'll have large chunks, obviously, for your work and career, and then there'll be smaller chunks for some of the other areas that you do. Well, I want to, again, invite you to look at time shifting. With time shifting, what we're going to look at is the inevitability of where we are now means that we have lost out. We've freed ourselves from the commute time, many of us. Many of us have now, obviously, a, a lot, much more fluid situation with our family or household. And so it's really looking at how we can take some of these elements that we have here and shift them around. Perhaps we can start work a little bit later on. If you're a business owner, maybe you want to see how you can rejig your day so business happens perhaps when the other family members or the other household are sleeping, because for some people, your best time may be at night. So these are some of the things I just want you to just consider as we move on to looking at how we can take this structure and now build some routine around it. So, Lisa, if you could move on to the next slide, please. Before we get into there, actually, uh, Anita, are there any questions that are appearing? Well, I think one thing that's interesting that comes out of that is a lot of people have been talking about unblocking commute time and say, isn't this great? We're getting all these hours back, which, okay, we are getting them back in one sense, but it depends on your own circumstances. It doesn't necessarily mean people have more time because if you have, say, children to look after, I think it's just very interesting, yeah. the blurring of time. So whereas mm. previously people may have used their commute to do their Ricardo shop or whatever it may be and do mm. some household admin, that's sort of gone. So I think the idea of building in those blocks is, is really great and putting some structure in. Mm. Um, yeah, so no, that, that sounds great. I think it's been really interesting to see where that, where that takes us. Well, good. In fact, um, one of the things you just touched on about what could we do with reclaiming our commute time is what I want to touch on right now, actually, as we move into this slide over here. So, folks, let's take a look at building better routines. And the first thing that I have here is something that I want to uh, invite you to. I keep using this word invite. I just love it. Uh, a lot of motivational speakers seem to use it. Anyway, there you go, subconscious programming. So let me invite you to look at the morning routine here. So the morning routine is a way here to re reclaim that commute time and use it for a better purpose. It also means that you have the opportunity to have a bit more of a lie-in as long as you can start to weave in this morning routine. So with this morning routine, I call it the 20-20-20 principle. It essentially looks like this. And by the way, this is just a flavor. It's an idea. It's for you to now make this your own. 20 minutes of movement. Now, this could be any kind of physical exercise of any sort, but what we're talking about here, and I know there are a lot of people who may not enjoy working out in the first thing in the morning. I'm gonna hold my hand up, I'm one of those. But 
you're in movement first thing in the morning, even if it is just briskly walking outside, if we're permitted and if it's safe and okay to do so, or indeed within your premises or just doing jumping jacks, finding an inventive physical activity to do. And it doesn't have to be vigorous, but something has a whole host of pharmacological benefits. Firstly, your, meta your metabolism is obviously spiked. Cortisol starts to go down as your metabolism raises because you're obviously moving and you're having some sort of exercise, some sort of physical exertion. Another number of things happen. Dopamine starts to increase. Serotonin is released. Now, these are all really helpful chemicals within the body. Dopamine is known as the sort of innovation or inspiration hormone because it's very conducive to elevated thinking, to problem solving, serotonin we all know about, BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. The stuff is known as fertilizer for the brain. Our brain cells are replenished when we have some physical activity in the morning. It, it, it's conducive to rejuvenating that BDNF production. There are a whole host of benefits to do at least something in the morning. It doesn't have to be your main workout, but let it be something that sparks the body and tells it that it needs to start getting into action. Of course, it improves our alertness and focus as well. The second 20 minutes is mind feed. By mind feed, I'm referring to that lovely M. I love this M. I've been doing it for 20 years. Meditation. That could be meditation as in any kind of meditation practice that you've come to know. If you don't, obviously, there are plenty of resources that you can look at to see how you can start to ease yourself into the process of some sort of meditation. It doesn't have to be faith-based, or it could be, but it's a process of where you're switching off from the outside world. Hopefully, your, play, your phone is still in do not disturb mode at this time. And it's that 20 minutes of sanctity for you. It's that sacred time where you have time just to be still and be in a meditative state. It could be mindfulness practices like simple breathing. And if we have time, I'll invite you during the session and we'll do a very short two minute practice together before we wrap up. Uh, and Anita, do me a favor, just keep me honest on that one and we'll do it. It's really, really cool and it will leave right. people in a cool state. So we'll try and inject that one in. So, and it's great. So 20 minutes of mind feed. Now, aside from meditation and motivation, meditation and mindfulness, that 20 minutes could also just be reading or listening to a podcast. In fact, it could double up your 20 minutes of movement by you having another 20 minutes of walking where you're walking and listening to a podcast. If you really want to go to town, I love doing this now, adapt your physical routine and stick a rucksack with five kilos in your, on your back. Your back is safe. Now you're starting to increase the intensity of your morning movement with simple hacks that don't require much money, time, or facilities. So think creatively how you can use that second pocket, but it's all about feeding the mind. The third pocket is journaling. And I know that some of you out there, especially the leaders here who have tuned in, this is something you'll not be a stranger to. Leadership programs often talk about journaling. But I think for everyone, journaling, especially as Anita, as you alluded to at the beginning, during these trying times where mental health is such a highlight, the opportunity to be able to write down our thoughts, our feelings, the results we're having or the results we're not getting, and put it down on paper or on keyboard. But there's something special about the writing, handwriting, there's a cognitive connection that happens when we handwrite. But writing it down somewhere is a powerful way to be able to take it out of our subconscious and put it down on paper. That starts to free our cognitive faculties to, of course, be more focused and more available and ready to tackle the things that come our way. That journalism will be expressing those things, and it's also expressing gratitude. The famous thing we all know about the whole gratitude process, I call it the gratitude zone, and it's three circles. Start with gratitude for the things that you have and you're happy with about yourself. Secondly, the second circle is gratitude for the people around you, your immediate loved ones, your friends. And the third area is gratitude for the wider sphere, the, the things that have happened to you, your possessions, the things that you've accomplished, your property, whatever it is. And those three circles of gratitude are a good way to inject that into your daily or regular routine. That's the first routine, <clears throat> mindful of time. So let's move to on to the second area of routine. Once we've got a morning routine down like that, oh, by the way, it doesn't have to be a 20-20-20. You may just have time and you want to just go and take two of those 20 minutes. That's cool. You may only want to just take one. The whole idea is to embrace one or all three aspects of that 2020-20 and have it make 
be the first thing in the morning, wherever possible before the kids get up, if you have kids, because that's what's going to ignite your ability to be able to start to contend, i.e. build your resilience to handle the day that comes ahead. Okay, time-focused task block. So everybody's familiar, I think, with high-intensity interval training. So I borrowed this from the world of interval training and fitness. A lot of studies indicate that the optimal time before attention span wanes during work is around 90 minutes. So a chunk of about 60 to 90 minutes work is the op optimal time before you'd want to take a break and recover your cognitive faculties and bring back that quality focus that you had before. So first thing is to look at how you can chunk up your day job or your business activities into 60 or 90 minute chunks, notwithstanding any long meetings, of course. See how you can start to pocket it like that. And then you have a 60 minute chunk, for example, for correspondence. And then you may have micro chunks for correspondence, but you have key chunks and we'll see how they fit in with this next point here. But start to structure things in 60, 90 minute chunks and then take a short break. Again, we'll come to that in a second. That leads me to this other point, the big rock. Uh, I borrowed this from Stephen Covey, really, really good stuff uh, in his uh, literature. So the big rocks, as he describes them, are the key things that we want to accomplish in any given week. And what we're talking about here is how we can take the key things that we want to accomplish, make a list of those key things that we want to accomplish during that week. And by setting ourselves up to be able to contend with those key things, there can be typically four to six big rocks that you want to accomplish during the week. They could be obviously work-related or non-work-related. Then what you want to do is start to inject one to two of those in each day. And then what you also have is then you have your MITs. Your MITs are your most important task. Now, your MITs may be the same as your big rocks, but there are also other important activities that you want to get done, typically on a day-to-day -day basis. So you've got your big rocks for the week, and you've got your MITs for the day, your most important task. Again, it could be work or non-work related. The important thing here that I want to emphasize is to attack your big rock, whichever of your two big rocks you have in the day, first. Really try and focus on getting that to be your first thing. What is the biggest thing that you can do in the morning to move the needle in your industry or in your workload? And I'll tell you a reason why. Science repeatedly tells us that focus, willpower, and energy, these three things are at their peak for most people in the morning. Some may have one and more, less of the other, but generally these three have a convergence in the morning. So to try and get that big rock done in the morning is going to be a really good thing. So how I see that perhaps you could look at is perhaps first do your 30 minutes of quick admin, essential emails, looking at what's on fire in your inbox, but what's on fire may not necessarily need addressing. I'm going to make a quick nod here to the Eisenhower matrix. It's also known as the important urgent matrix. As leaders, those of you who are tuned in, you'll certainly be familiar with it as with my fellow coaches and consultants. I'll invite you to take a look and check it out, but it allows you to be able to detangle yourself from getting caught up in firefighting mode in the first, as the first thing you do when you turn your computer on. Instead, you can just filter your emails, look at those things which precisely you just need a little bit of attention first thing in the morning for a half an hour, and then boom, go attack your big rock. That's what I want to say a little bit about that. Um, and then the other thing that I want to add to this piece before moving off is make sure that once you finish that big rock, we take a break. Again, I'm going to come to this now. This, this is where positive distractions come in. So I call this antagonistic supersets. I'm a fitness guy. I love this being in the gym. So antagonistic supersets is a term used when you're in the gym, weight training, for example, where you exercise your chest muscles, but then you do something for your back muscles, which are opposing muscles. You, you intersperse a push and a pull, pull movement. So what I'm asking you to explore is how you can do your 90-minute sprint, chunk of work, your big rock, or your most important task, and then do something that's completely different. It may be 15 minutes of walking. It may be 15 minutes of doing a bit of study time with your kids, or maybe 15 minutes of preparing a light snack or a podcast, but it's something that's very contrastingly different to what you just did, because that change is as good as an optimal break. 
Again, another couple of things I want to throw in here. Power naps. I think most of us are familiar with that. We all know industry leaders out there who rave on about power naps out there. But I also want to invite you to look at a principle called the caffeine nap. So the caffeine nap is something I came across. I've introduced it in my own routine. I've got clients doing it. I have about a 70% success rate from the feedback I get. So the caffeine nap is based on the principle that generally for most people, the caffeine content within your coffee takes around about 20 minutes to metabolize. So the trick here is when you've done a sprint of work and you're really feeling you're kind of flagging, is to take a break, go find somewhere horizontal or somewhere comfortable on a couch to lie down or on, a, or on a chair. I put an eye mask on because blocking out light for those 20 minutes has an important part in cutting out blue light, it's another aspect of health and well-being. Block out light, put an eye mask on. If you're lying down, cover your eyes and, and do that after having a little bit of coffee. So knock back some coffee, lie down, or take a break in a power nap for 20 minutes. Generally, just by the time you've had enough rest for your cognitive and mental faculties, that coffee will kick in, and then you'll start to feel alert again. And later on, I'm going to touch on some supplements and brain food that you can inject into that coffee before you take your caffeine or power nap, which I think will be quite interesting. Um, so, yeah. That's the other thing, and obviously I've just mentioned here, positive distractions, mini hobby. Now, I'm going to give you an example of my own personal life. Um, I love singing and playing. I do music. I, we sometimes incorporate music and singing into our retreat, um, and I love doing that as part of the stuff I do. It's kind of different. So part of my personal development in music and singing is I just, in long chunks of work, I'll just take 15 minutes and go do some piano education. So I have an online course. I have some online vocal training. I'll actually just do my vocal training or piano playing for 15 minutes somewhere in the day. And it really breaks things up. It annoys the rest of the family, of course, as you'd imagine, but it's really cool. Um, so again, I want to invite you to have some positive distractions. Lastly, before we go to any questions, Anita, let's take a look for a moment at what we can do at the end of the day. We really need to also look at what we should be doing at the end of the day. And I want to invite you to end the day with purpose. We've started the day with intention. You know, we've had our key priorities, and that's important. But what I want to ask is, how can we end this day with purpose? And so one of the things to do, you started journaling in the morning. In, the, in that morning journal session, you would have hopefully set your intentions for the day, what you want to have out of the day, how you want to show up for the day. Don't forget. The body and the mind go where our thoughts go. So if we can really gravitate our thoughts first thing in the morning towards the things that we want, setting our intention, there's a higher chance that our subconscious and our biophysical faculties will direct us in that direction. So in the same way, at the end of the day, it's a time for reflection. And so that would look something like this. Write down, and I call this the mini self status report, by the way. So we're all used to doing status reports. I say do a mini self status report. Highlight your wins of the day. Highlight your worries of the day. Highlight the things that didn't work out for the day and are outstanding. Anything that turned up that's urgent. Maybe you write down anything that you've learned from this current climate about how you can change, change and shift your work practices. Perhaps it's a colleague who's been in need or a team member if you're a leader and some lessons that you've learned that you need to ramp up your empathy or you need to find a way to engage certain talent that's being neglected at the moment. But it's that reflection time at the end of the day, reflecting on what's happened during the day, and then also writing down a couple of things that you've been grateful for for the day. And then also, and I, I, I love this, this comes from a study back in the 1950s. Find your three or five key MITs or big rocks that you want to focus on on the next day. Write those down get them prioritized, and then before you shut, shut eyes, you've got a list of things that you're going to attack the next day. So rather than it be sitting in your head, and for a lot of us, I know this, I know from a lot of people I speak to, especially leaders who are worried because they're carrying additional concerns at the moment during this climate, if they're written down towards the close of your working day and they're prioritized, you know that it's ready to go for the next day. So those are the things I'd like to suggest that we could look at during that time at the end of the day. Right. Yeah, just a couple, a couple of questions on that that are just coming in. Uh, I mean, that all sounds fantastic. It's um, building in those routines, particularly in the morning, I think is great. So you don't end up on that slope of 
logging on and still sitting at the same desk at 10 p.m. at night. And you, yeah. you know, that's okay for a few days, but it's not sustainable for the long term. Um, right. The question is, yeah, how long does it take for that new habit structure to kick in and stick? And how do you hold yourself accountable for those? So it all sounds great. And we've all been in situations where you might join the gym and you get really excited and you start some sort of new exercise routine. And then two weeks in, you're a bit fed up with it and it falls by the wayside and you feel like you mm -hmm. haven't succeeded in that. Yeah. How do we keep that going? Because it seems fairly clear, unfortunately, that this situation is not going to end in the next uh, couple of weeks and no. we need to sort of uh, pace ourselves. But how would you That's suggest we do that? Great question. Um, really, really good question. So let me shoot back with two schools of thought. There's a traditional school of thought, and I think many of you who are tuned in on this will recognize the famous, it takes 21 days to build in a habit. Now, there is other research, especially in the past sort of five years that's coming out. Uh, I think it was a study by Imperial University. I may be wrong. Don't quote me on it. Studies now show that it takes typically 60 days for a habit to really be ingrained in. And that's built up of three components. And I don't want you to feel down about the duration I've just said. It's not as bad as it sounds. But let me help to pre-manage uh, pre your expectations. Because I think if we manage our expectations about habit entrainment, it's going to be easier. So the habit entrainment protocol, as I call it, looks like this. There are three stages in habit entrainment. It's, the first part is habits are awfully painful in the first 20 days to try and embrace and do. Then they become messy in the middle because you're kind of bedding into the habits, but sometimes you're falling off the horse again. Sometimes you get thrown away by some other life mishap. And so they're messy in the middle. But you're starting to build neural connections that are helping you to entrain that habit. And now it's starting to happen that you doing the habit rather than not doing it is becoming more of the norm. And then third, Thirdly, the third stage of this process is it becomes glorious at the end. The habits are horrible in the beginning to entrain, messy in the middle, and I say glorious at the end. Because in those last, that last third, now you, your practice of that habit has become so regular that the frequency of non-conformance with the habit has gone down, and now you'll actually feel uncomfortable if you don't do it. I, I can speak to this, I testify to this personally, many clients have. But how to do this in this current climate is, Start. You know, a friend of mine once said, the best training program for your fitness is the one that you actually choose and stick to. So there's some wisdom in that. Rather than trying to conquer something and, you know, say that I'm going to get really fit in, a, in, in, in the while I'm here in a couple of months, look at just a simple thing that we can do. So I'm always a big fan of micro-chunking down those sorts of goals. So a good way to do that is take anything that we're doing, deconstruct it. If it's that 60 minutes thing that we talked about at the beginning of the 2020 20, take 20 minutes, just start that. Aim for 60 to 70% adherence throughout the first week or two. Don't look for 100% consistency because otherwise you set yourself up for failure, there's inner critics, and then you start to fall off the wagon. Instead, if you aim for a 50 to 60 compliance rate for that habit, there's a higher chance that you'll start to entrain it. And also don't forget to reward yourself, right? To have some little wins or you can kind of treat yourself with a movie or a little snack or playtime with the kids, which, again, is part of this whole current lockdown situation. Does that help, Anita? Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. It's really helpful. And I also think it's important to be realistic. Mm. You know, I, I, for me personally, three young children, it's not going to be possible to do absolutely yeah. everything um, and not speak yourself up about it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. That's right. Welcome. 7% mm -hmm. clients. Folks, that's all. Lisa, thank you. Got the, uh, yeah, okay, so productivity. So, folks, again, uh, this, I didn't want this to be a productivity 101. You all know this. We all know this. But let's talk about productivity in, in the context of working around with a family. So I put together a number of things I want to share here. And I want to start with managing expectations, again, as Alita just rightly alluded to. Now, for me, managing expectations really falls into three areas. Managing expectations with yourself. You've got to be real, exactly as Anita, I, you know, you took the words out of my mouth. You have kids, you have dependents, you may have elderly, and you'll have things that are always going to throw you out of kilter when you're trying to 
adopt some of these routines for your work-life balance. It's easy to then get an inferiority complex and start to defeat ourselves. And then eventually what happens is the whole thing just goes off. So far better is to manage your expectations and look to see what can get pushed out by a few days, perhaps even put on the back burner indefinitely. Because there could be some things, whether it's in your work-related or non-work-related life, that don't need that urgent attendance. And you can thereby free some of your bandwidth in order to put this routine into place and forgive yourself with that 60 to, or 50 to 60% adherence. That's the first thing, manage your own expectations. Secondly, manage your team's expectations. I think it's important for us, you know, obviously spending years in corporate, working with teams remotely, a lot of my work was with teams internationally. It was, I found it crucial for us to manage our expectations, uh, especially teams in India, Hong Kong, where there were power cuts and things like that. So what we focused on is agreeing to do the essentials, what was essential to keep the show on the road. And therefore, I invite you to consider how you can communicate with your teams, help them to understand that you'll keep up the essentials to avoid being a bottleneck, and perhaps those other things that are not essential can be attended to later on or divvied up with the rest of the team. And that can be shared around. Certainly, if there are routine activities that can be shared amongst team members, you can look at rotating how you do those things. Again, consider whether doing some odd hours would also make days less stressful. So it could be if that flexibility is there, see if you can work with your team, or if you're a business owner, by the same token, see if you can split that eight-hour or nine-hour day into three hours at night when the family are asleep, three hours in the morning and something in the middle. A lot of big companies, Google, a lot of tech firms are obviously big advocates for this as well. The third area about managing expectation is with your dependents. Your children, for example, it's not easy for them. And if they are at an age where they can comprehend or, or they can be made to comprehend in a playful way, see how you can help them to start to understand that mommy or daddy isn't going to be around at certain times of the day. So those are the three areas in terms of managing expectation. The second area is the, cover, is the family meeting. So I think pretty much all of us have had our family meetings by now. If we're, and for many of us, we're probably needing to do them again and again. That's the newsflash here, folks. These things don't just happen once. <laughs> Many people I'm working with right now regularly have to have family meetings to remind them that I'm not going to be available from 12 till 2, that I, yes, I'll go and do the cooking and the dinner routine on a Thursday and a Friday, but I can't do it on a Saturday. So having a family meeting to cover some key things off is really important about what everyone is looking to do, what everybody wants to do. How will we structure our days as members of the household? Who will do certain key tasks? And again, I go back to that thing that we may need to rotate those tasks and divvy them up for fairness. And what are we going to do about some key practicalities, you know, meal rotations, food, shopping, so on and so forth. So looking at those key areas in that what, when, who, and how, and applying some fairness and some flex to it. Because let's face it, right, we're going to put something together in a week's time, it's all going to fall apart because the household can't keep up with it and, you know, some crazy making happens along the today, especially with other colleagues or whatever you have. So having that flexibility and having regular sessions um, in project management, we obviously, those of you familiar with that, we call them huddles in agile project management. So have your huddles, your family huddles on a regular basis in order to start to bring that sense of communication together. Thirdly, I know I've alluded to already, so I won't go into too much detail, set your do not disturb. Folks, we all have a phone with an airplane mode. So I'm a big advocate to go into airplane mode for ourselves. Go into do not disturb mode. Put that sign up on your door, wherever your office space is, where it, whatever you've created as your office space. Um, and that, by the way, you should, you should consider, I'm going to go against the trend. This is a bit unorthodox. Consider changing your office space. Don't just work from the same work area. See if you can work from somewhere else. Swap it around for two key reasons. One, the sheer fairness with the other family members, right? So you're not hogging the one space. And secondly, a change of the location, again, is as good as a break. Uh, I, I, I lost count of the amount of time myself and people I work with get inspirational ideas and little flashes of imagination just by changing from working where they are to the garden or to another room. So have do not disturb areas and set those boundaries with your family members. And obviously, then it's being able to flex because we can plan, we can prep, but obviously these things can change. Now, 
aside from planning and preparing, preparing for kids, um, all the stuff that we would already uh, imagine you're doing in terms of homeschooling, uh, preparing meals and snacks in advance for the kids, another area that I found a lot of success with, especially in the past four or five weeks, actually, is getting your children or even elders, those who are living with you, to become marshals or put them in charge of certain areas, delegate some activities. So I'll give you a great example. One of my clients right now, she's a stressed out recruitment exec, and she has a teenage son, and, you know, she often, she was saying he's driving her mad. So he was um, really causing her a lot of trouble, but there was one amazing thing that he had. He had a, I asked her, you know, is there anything he likes? Because he actually likes cooking. So it turned out that he likes cooking, 13-year-old kid. I said, so, so, so who does the cooking? She goes, well, I do. I said, well, have you thought about maybe giving him the opportunity and stepping up in doing this? Okay, she tried it out for a week. Two weeks, three weeks later, fast forward, he's got three meals a week. It's his place. The kitchen is his space. He gets creative. He's now got a meal menu planned out. He gets, he's, he's going out and finding new ideas of things to cook. He's getting savvy with the limited food that he's got. It's, he's created a whole new of stuff. And now he's starting to write about it and blog about it. So you never know if you tap in and just explore what skills and talents are hiding within your beloved family members, who you're stepping on the toes of and who are annoying the heck out of you and me from time to time. You just might find some gold there. It's just the question of being a little humble, but it's emotional intelligence there, right, folks? Um, and just seeing what actually we can fan, what goodness we can fan in there. While we're becoming forgiving of ourselves and them, what can we fan and delegate and put them in charge of? And then rotate that, you know, by being humble enough to do the same. So, yeah, real fan of that. Um, virtual play dates. Um, Anita, I'm sure you've got this one down, right? Virtual have- play dates. Yeah, you got that right. So I, I don't need to say much about How's it working out for you with virtual play dates with your kids' parents and, you know, having some shared resources? It's actually good. I mean, you know, my five-year-old, what he hasn't quite grasped is you've got to be within eyeline of the camera for your for his friends to actually see him. So it actually involves both of them randomly wandering off to their bedrooms and getting toys and all that sort of stuff. But actually, they're really happy. It works. It seems to work so far. And it, it fills 20 minutes. So, you know, it's good. <laughs> but, I, I, uh, no. It's a really recommended, Anita, you're already on it. She's an advocate. So folks, consider virtual pay dates. Have a few family members or friends and people you want to share and go do some stuff. If you don't like one of them, you can always just kick them out. Just joking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Karen just, Pog. Go just a couple of questions, um, Prash, coming through. Um, how do you get the family on board with supporting you with all of this? And also, how do you deal with the guilt of not being more present with your children at the moment? Great. So... Two ways I would like to suggest. One, with regards to the first question, what a number of people I've been working with now are doing, uh, some of you will be familiar with vision boards. So I've got them to get really visual about this. Create a big board where you've got the activities of the week or the weeks ahead kind of in big, colorful clouds. Now, within that, have something that has some kind of reward, some fun factor to it. It could be on a weekly basis typically, which would be great. And what you're doing is you're you're building a vision for everybody in your household and your kids suddenly have something that they can look forward to, right? So, okay, you're going to have two, three days of this, but there's actually some fun. On Friday, it's going to be a fun Friday. We're going to make pizzas. We're going to do this. So start to ideate a list of things that you can do as a family together, something that will break up that norm and inject that into a daily or a weekly basis. But make it visual. That's my emphasis. By making it visual and then having a little huddle with the family in the morning, it may not be the first thing in the morning. Obviously, everybody's schedules don't match. But having a focal point, a time during the day, 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock, whatever it is where the family come together just for a quick check-in. Folks, we're doing this you know, with our colleagues when we're at work, right? When we sit desk to desk, we often go for lunch with our colleagues, right? So why not do it with our own family members? Why not just put in a new house rule, right? Say, hey, folks, we're going to have a new house rule during this new normal. Every day we're going to take 15 minutes during the day for a quick check-in at 12 o'clock. Let's see how everybody's doing. And really exonerate those younger members of of the household to feel that their voice is heard, to feel like that they are like being treated as adults. And I think that Certainly from my experience with some of the clients I've been working with, that started to pay some good dividends. 
And secondly, to the point that you described, without the guilt, I would say this. Part of those MITs should be a bit of time where you can make sure you can assuage that guilt by injecting it in. Now, a lot of people see this as I'll spend time with my kids kind of once in it every few days. What I invite you to do is do a 10 or a 15 minute thing. And yes, in the beginning, it's going to be like, hey, is that all I get, 15 minutes? But what it's going to do, it's going to start, it's going to ensure that that bond is kept. And Anita, I guess you could speak more to this. I'm mindful of the time now left on this. But that's what I would invite you to do. Right. Brilliant. Thank you. Great. And I think we'll leave, uh, we're on to our last few slides, folks. Mm -hmm. Wow, there's so much to cram in. So forgive me if I'm rushing through a little bit of this. Uh, but I'll still hold true if I can. Um, okay, so how to reduce, test, and restore focus, one of my passion areas, um, one of my big areas that I enjoy consulting on. But let's look at a few things that we can really do. So we've touched on this earlier, setting your intention. The setting your intention we touched on before, um, that's coming through journaling, and it's making sure that you've got a clear idea of what you're looking to achieve, but then having enough flexibility to not beat yourself up if you don't achieve it in a day. And therefore, I always invite people to do, take a week view, take a day view, use your MITs in your big rocks, and don't beat yourself up if you don't get them all done. We understand. So being forgiving on yourself and having intention. Secondly, carving out your space. I've already alluded to this. So we talked about how we can have a space and then be flexible on sharing that space with other people. Thirdly, calendar usage. Um, love this as a productivity geek. I love this one. Calendar usage means Obviously, you'll have your own corporate calendars, work calendars. What I was really looking at here is more productivity tools uh, that you, is, is, I beg your pardon, is really ensuring you've got some face-to-face -face meetings, uh, stuff that you've actually put in. So actually block out time for your breaks as well. So when, if you've got shared calendars, your colleagues know when to not disturb you. If you've got do not disturb times, put those in. You can even schedule, and this is great, by the way, to help you to entrain some of the habits, the question that was asked earlier deliberately schedule three times a week, as an example, that you're going to listen to a podcast 30 minutes three times a week. You're going to get in a, a walk three times a week, even if it's inside your house, just walking up and down or running three times a week. So putting it into your calendar, along with do not disturb times, and putting into your calendar times, specific times for answering your correspondences for journaling, is a great way to start to make sure that it starts to show up for you on a day-to-day -day basis. The calendar will annoy the damn heck out of you. It's lacking reminders, and that's going to get you into submitting a little bit and complying slowly. So that's a good one. Um, Check-in. What I mean by check-ins is this whole thing, and leaders, obviously, I know this is a big thing for you at the moment, how to ensure your workforce remains connected, stays connected, and stays engaged. So a key way that can, this can be done is having task-tracking tools that you can share. I don't mean micromanaging. I mean tools like Asana, Trello, Microsoft Teams, where you can use those on a for yourself to start to see how you're tracking tasks. And then I alluded this, to this before, the question that was asked about how you can better stick to habits. This is gonna help with this. Rope in an accountability buddy. Find somebody from your workplace who you can rope in and they become your accountability buddy, maybe your teammate. What you're doing is you're sharing that workspace or workflow tools, Trello, Asana, Monday.com, any of these tools, and you put those key tasks both work and non-work related if you want, or if you're choosing, agree with what you're going to track there with your accountability buddy. Pop that in. Now you can start to put those habits in there too. So you, now you've got an accountability buddy or an accountability buddy group who can help each other to stay connected. And then at the end of every single workday, just have 15 minutes just to connect with those accountability buddies. Check in with them, see what's one, see what's not. That will feed into your journaling at night. And that way you can really start to get traction and adherence to some of these practices. So just moving on, reduce stress, restore focus, the JAM principle. So I want to touch on this. I did a video on this on social media recently. The, the JAM principle is this, just a minute. It simply is one minute of mindfulness or meditation or breathing at least five times a day. Literally, that simple act has profound benefits. To switch off, I, there was time we'd do this right now, but the act of switching off and not thinking about the next damn thing that we're going to do or the things that we should have done this morning and actually focusing on just our breath or 
if you like, with your open eyes on a very fixed object, and I teach this in some of the meditation work I do, is a profound way to really just bring the mind and the sensual faculty back within oneself, even just for that minute. And then you open your eyes and you carry on with it. Doing that five times a day at least, multiple times, is going to start to have profound effect. It sounds simple, but over the course of a week or two, it will have compounding beneficial effects. And you'll see, so I invite you to jam with me. Try the jam principle. The other idea here is that to reduce stress and restore focus is the five-minute mover and shaker. It's what it says on the tin. Go move and shake yourself. It's, it's everybody who's on this call right now who hates exercise, who doesn't want to do it, who can't be motivated. Guess what? Here's your golden ticket. Do it for five minutes. Go walk. Take a call for five minutes. But essentially, it's taking a non-work call, by the way. Take five minutes. Go move. Go shake. Go dance. Um, Patrick's lazy fan. Dirty dancing. Yeah, probably too young for that, you guys. But anyway, find something. <laughs> do it for five minutes and then go back. That will help to reduce the stress naturally. It will also elevate that dopamine a little bit. There's five minutes is enough to start trigger, triggering those hormonal responses from the parasympathetic system. So I invite you to do five minutes of moving and shaking. Now, another area, love talking about this, mindful of time here, brain food. Brain food for stress and focus. Now, obviously, I'll do the old disclaimer here. I'm not a medical professional. Don't beat me up. Certainly don't sue me, um, although you've got a great law firm right here, full services law firm, no less. But don't do that, please. Um, but instead, let me offer you some things that I have personally used on my human laboratory and at least 28 lab rats in the past six months alone. And I've had some great feedback from the majority of them. So <laughs> I'm going to share with these. So the stuff that I'm referring to here, again, check with your medical practitioner, are things that are mostly non-contraindicatory non with other medicines. And they have little side effects. And they've been proven for a long time. I'm going to refer to some stress-boosting herbs. Ashwagandha, it's a member of the ginseng family, uh, Korean ginseng, Chinese ginseng, ashwagandha is Indian ginseng. But specifically, ashwagandha is a very, very good example of an adaptogenic. Adaptogenics help, help our body to deal with stress and help us to get through difficult situations. I actually had personal experience. I suffered over a long year of chronic fatigue and adrenal fatigue. It was a horrible time of my life. I self-repaired using ashwagandha and a whole bunch of other natural alternatives and breathing and meditation and stuff. So I invite you to look at some of these things like ashwagandha. The mushroom family has some great mushroom um, variants that help to do both these things, to reduce stress and to restore focus. The key ones I want to mention here are reishi, lion's mane, cordyceps. These are great examples. Now, I've also, uh, oh, rhodiola rosea is also another good example of a non-mushroom herb. The other quick things I've put here are smart herbs. They feature on great supplements from Bulletproof. A lot of big supplement manufacturers out there who are doing smart supplements will include these. But they're really good on their own. I've actually got them right here in my glass of alkalized lemon water with cider apple vinegar. Yeah, I drink that stuff. I know, it's crazy. Three liters a day um, I have. And in there, there's some theanine. So theanine, tyrosine, and carnitine are great neurotransmitters. They're non-essential amino acids. And they're, in small quantities, they genuinely can help to improve your focus and alertness. And tyrosine also helps reduce stress as well. Again, do your own research, but I just wanted to show that. Um, last thing to just say before we round up with any Q&A, and I've got a slide after this. Ending the day with purpose, we've touched on that. Um, gratitude, finishing that day with knowing that you're going to have your three or five key things for the next day lined up, and they're going to be out of your head onto a list then the gratitude practice, and then obviously time for you to reflect on how you've been for the day. A lot of philosophizing going on here, and, you know, I'm getting on the woo-woo angle here, which I have no shame with, because I think spirituality is um, an area that we just, um, a lot of us misinterpret as something that, you know, it's a taboo, but actually I'm talking about our unconscious mind. And um, we talk about emotional intelligence, EQ. Well, I'm a big fan of subconscious and unconscious intelligence. And it's a powerful area to tap into, which plays out into every aspect of our being. And obviously, let's not forget one key thing. And I guess this is the take takeaway message for all of us. The heart of every single business and every single career, every single successful business and career is us, because we're the source of our business. 
we're the source of our career, our job role. So if we can get ourselves right with that body, mind, and spirit triangle, in whichever way you look at it, it doesn't have to be faith-based, we start to put ourselves in a position, and I'm walking testimony of this through the challenges and trials I've had to be where I am today, annoy the heck out of you with all this, you know, constant verbiage. But honestly, some of it actually has been proven. I've actually done this. I live this life. Um, annoying as it is to some family members. I love it. Um, but really look at how you can really put yourself first, because then you will show up as the leader for your team. I have a big thing at the moment. A lot of leaders are approaching me saying that they're stressing out because they've given everybody else the oxygen mask instead of themselves. I think yeah. it's time. All the leaders who are tuned in, Anita, I know you concur. It's time we put our own oxygen mask on. It's time we take everything we've learned on this deck and apply it to ourselves as well as our team. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pat, I'm going to, um, I've got a couple of uh, questions that have come in. I just wonder if we can, maybe in about two minutes, just quickly mm. go through these. Um, one really great question saying, absence levels have decreased since COVID-19 and our organisations working 100% from home. Um, really good point. How can you spot presenteeism remotely? It's a great question. Um, let me give you a few thoughts straight off the bat, um, which, funnily enough, um, working with someone on at the moment. Um, we could go, go crazy on this and have mm. uh, enterprise level tools that are put on the desktop. I know one of my big banking clients, uh, we did that, you know, there were mouse and keyboard keystroke trackers. But that's kind of, you know, one extreme. A less extreme yeah. option is just to have, uh, uh, one idea is to have, just get mini status reports, make them real easy to be completed. Mini status reports that are just circulated to the team or to your line management, just to show what worked, what didn't work, and so forth. Of course, this requires management to have a high degree of empathy, great emotional intelligence skill to have, and leaders, of course. Um, that allows a little bit more um, ability for management to check, check in on whether presenteeism is happening or not by the level of output and what's being reported in that. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is just having regular huddles as well that you can have just during the day, just check in. I think leaders, especially at the moment, to take 15 minutes out twice in the day where you literally just have a bridge. Open your bridge as a leader or as a team lead and manager. You just have your bridge open saying, I've got my bridge open twice a day at these slots. Just feel free to check in if you have anything you want to cover. I think these ways can start to help reduce that kind of presenteeism. Is that okay, yeah. Anita? Sorry, yeah, I'm mindful yeah, of time. I think it's, it, no, it's, um, I think that's really helpful because it's just about keeping an eye out for our people and making sure that everyone's okay and just yeah. how to sort of spot those that might be struggling and need a bit more support. Uh, mm -hmm. Another quick question, how do you switch off when trying to get to sleep? If our, Hopefully some of those techniques you talked about would help, but it can yeah. be hard if you're um, looking at a laptop till late at night to then sleep. How, how would you suggest we deal with that? We've got very limited time, but we can mm. do it. So, yeah, I'm going to skip the whole blue light filter stuff and all the kind of yeah. free stuff that's out there. And I'm going to say this. Realize that sleep is essential and it's an investment. People need to start seeing sleep as an investment for the rest of the actual day. If we start to reframe sleep as an investment, know that we need to get that minimum six hours in, mm -hmm. whether it's at nine o'clock or whether it's at midnight, we're going, to start to, we're going to start to respect sleep a little bit more and have that regular sleep, sleep routine at the end. I always encourage data switch off and device switch off an hour beforehand, get into some kind of routine like reading, mindfulness, or a meditation. I have a little surprise at the end as well that may just help with that. Um, but also remember to create an optimal sleep environment, no blue lights darkness, etc. That right. will help to switch off. Okay. That, thanks, Prash. I'm sorry to um, cut that short at the end. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you for giving us the time. Um, it's been fantastic, actually, and there's so much to go through. Um, just mm -hmm. to up there with some more information on Prash. Um, as I said, this, this session is being recorded, so we're going to send the link out. Um, and there's also a um, link on the Owen Mitchell website. So every Thursday at 11 a.m., please join us with some fantastic speakers coming up there, um, as obviously we've had today with Prash. And there's also an email address um, that you can send your feedback to. All feedback would be really appreciated on today's session, but also any ideas where you'd like any future subjects covered. Um, so I, I'm going to sort of round us off, but Prash, was there any final words we had from you? Any final remarks? Yeah. Thank you, Anita. Um, just to say, Lisa, if you can just flash up that, that last slide that we had um, with the link on. So I just want to touch on this. Um, just really to say, um, we've, got, I've, we've got two timely offerings at the moment. 
that we're offering six week online masterminds, one for your remote workforce, coaching every week, and one for crisis leadership, a crisis leadership mastermind. So if you're interested, do reach out and we'll explore if those programs all online can help you with your colleagues and your leadership. And lastly, I have a free gift. I'm really proud to offer you a 21 minute guided audio meditation. It's got proprietary brain tech, and I've just been stuck away with geek technology producing it, but it's specifically designed to reduce stress, restore calm, immunity and focus, and it's just got the right level of woo-woo, and the rest of it is really cool. So don't be scared, okay, guys? Um, you can go grab it at stresstosuccess.co forward slash gift, and I'd be delighted if you'd love to reach out with me and let me know how you go. It's just been created. It's getting rave reviews from people in Australia and the U.S. at the moment. I'm so keen to have it out with all of you, and it's to be used every single day for 21 days. That's my challenge to all of you. Inject it into your 2020 in the morning. I want to thank Anita. Anita, it's been an absolute and surprising pleasure to be with all of you, and by extension, every single one of the people in Owen Mitchell and the team who've made this possible. My gratitude to all of you. Thank you, Prash, and thank you to everyone, all the participants that have dialed in. Um, had great numbers today and a real range of uh, different professionals. So thank you, and thank you, Prash, and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.